Come on in, pull up a chair and take a load off because today I will be sharing a little bit of a how to play as well as my review of Crystal Palace, which is from Furlan Games and Capstone Games. Would this heavier weight Euro game please even Queen Victoria herself? Or is this a World's Fair game which is foul and not deserving a place in your collection? Well, you're going to find out right after this. Howdy, 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 gang. Welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. So as I mentioned in the open, I am going to be sharing a little bit of a how to play as well as my review of Crystal Palace in just a moment. But first, I do want to remind you, if you like this video, by all means, give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't already. And if you do, ding that bell. It will not only let you know when I upload videos such as this review, it will also tell you when I also stream my live show, The Gaming Gang Dispatch, Monday through Thursday nights right here on YouTube as I bring you the latest in tabletop gaming news. And of course, when you're not watching videos on The Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. All right, without further ado, we are diving on into Crystal Palace, which is from Fjordland Games and Capstone Games. It's available in North America in English by way of Capstone Games. It's designed by Carson Lauber with artwork provided by Andrea Elmano. This game is for two to five players, ages 14 and up, Plays in about an hour to two and a half hours, depending on the player count. It does carry an MSRP of $69.95. This game did arrive back in 2019 on the scene. I recently received it from the fine folks over at Capstone Games to provide you with this review. Do want to mention, neither I nor anyone else affiliated with the gaming gang has received any other sort of compensation from Capstone Games or anyone else for me to provide my thoughts about this game. It's important that you know that. All right, let's swing on over to the other camera because I've got Crystal Palace kind of set up. Crystal Palace is set a couple of years before the 1851 World's Fair that was held in London at the titular Crystal Palace, which unfortunately at one point afterwards burnt to the ground. So the Crystal Palace is no more, but it was supposed to be just an amazingly beautiful building. So the game is going to start off in 1849 leading up to the World's Fair. So there are five turns in the game itself. Each is approximately six months in length, and you will have different rounds or phases during each of those turns. So, of course, I've kind of got everything packed in here so you can get a, a better look. I will zoom in towards the end of the review, to kind of show off some of the artwork on the cards and uh, just the really nice component quality to everything that's uh, set up here for Crystal Palace. So the first thing I do want to mention is the rule book, and the rule book is really nicely done these out of the way because I'm sure it's going to mess some stuff up but just to kind of give you a look at the rule book this is one of the better rule books I've seen in a while because not only do we get everything about setting up and what is the goal of the game which essentially the goal of the game is victory points there are a variety of ways for you to obtain those victory points but that is the name of the game getting victory points then it goes through each of these phases of these turns to tell you exactly what is going on during these phases. This is a heavier Euro. It's important to understand that. And it's going to take some, some playthroughs before you start 
to have everything click and begin to come up with some strategies to utilize in order to come out on top. But we've got plenty of images. Everything is laid out. So thankfully, the rule book made everything clear. So we were able to understand how to play the game. Now, that's not saying that we didn't have to go back and forth to the rule book to check things out, because we did, and we did it quite a bit. But thankfully, everything is here in the book, and it, it's explained very well and fairly concisely, too. Something else to uh, keep in mind is there are a lot of icons in this game. So we've got a bit of uh, a player aid. It's an appendix here, but to me, it's more of a player aid. And it talks about details of the different components of the game, as well as some of the character cards. Because what's going on here at Crystal Palace is each of the players is taking the reins of a country's exhibits at the World's Fair. So I have the American player board here, and we will take a closer look at the player board as well. We have five different player boards. They are dual-sided, so we have 10 countries in total. Very cool. One of the nice aspects of this as well is that each of the nations do have specific objectives that they're trying to reach to score more victory points, and they're different. Everybody's is a little bit different. I mean, there is some overlap. There are some that are the same, but it's not everybody trying to do the same thing. So very, very cool. Like that a lot. So essentially what goes on in Crystal Palace is to start off, you're going to be looking to uh, actually pay for your dice. So everybody's going to start off with four dice. It is possible for you to get more dice than just these four, but you're going to start off with the four dice. And to begin each of the rounds, you're going to need to pay for your workers, which are basically your dice. And this is something I thought was very, very cool because what you're doing is you're deciding the value of the dice and then you have to pay for them. So each of the players will start off with their nation board right here, right? We'll take a closer look at this a little bit later. You're going to have one gear, one energy. Those are um, some of the currencies of the game. So we've got gears, we've got energy, we have money. So we have different pound notes here, anywhere from one to 10. I got to be honest, I, I like the fact that we've got these little uh, bills here as opposed to paper money. I just do not like paper money in games. So I really, really like the fact that we've got these little pound notes and they are different sizes. So the smaller denomination is smaller than the larger denomination, as you can kind of see. So you're going to start off with that. You're going to have your dice. We've got some markers that we're going to utilize as well. I'm going to kind of tour around, show you what this is, and uh, kind of explain what's going on from there. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to assign value to your dice. And essentially what happens here is you're going to do this in secret. Now you've got these little boxes, these treasure chests that each of the players gets. And essentially what you're supposed to do is you're just supposed to take all of that colors, tokens and dice and everything, put them in there. What we were also using these for was to cover our dice before we would reveal them at the beginning of each of the rounds. So what will happen here is that you're going to assign these values and you're going to have to pay for these values. So each pip on the die is going to cost you a pound. It's very important to keep in mind, whoever spends the most money on their dice combined is going to be the first player and then it's going to rotate from there. So 
interestingly enough, you don't always want to be the first player. Sometimes you want to be kind of in the middle of the of the round. Sometimes you want to be going last. So an interesting twist is because usually it's everybody wants to be the first player. Many games are designed that way. You want to be the first player. Not so much with Crystal Palace. And that's kind of cool. So one of the aspects is that you're going to assign values. Now we're going to look. We've got all these different areas around London that we can visit. Basically, we're going to assign our dice. And some of them have a minimum value that we have to meet or exceed in order to place a die there. So it's kind of funny because you'll see as an example here, if we want to try to raise our buzz at the London Times, it's, you know, to get that first spot, it's going to cost us five or more, but it'll also give us a bonus assistant action, something I'll also talk about as well. Do you want to mention... I'm not going to take a deep dive into the gameplay here because there's a lot of things going on. There are a lot of moving parts. And this game has been out since 2019. I know there are a lot of how-to-play videos out there, so I don't, I don't want to just repeat it. But I want to show off what's really cool about this game. All right, so we've got this, this tracking board here. This is kind of our scoreboard that's going to keep an eye on our buzz. So as far as the our buzz... What we're looking at here is it's uh it's it's pretty much how much excitement has our nation created? How much press are we getting in the lead up to the World's Fair? And we're going to move along on a track because we've got different ways for us to generate buzz. And it's kind of cool because if you're the first person to reach certain points, you're going to score some bonus tiles. So for an example, this would give us a bonus energy. Uh, and there are various different tiles of these colors. So these will be different every game. They're not always going to be the same. Now, granted, we have these color coded. So this is, this is not as an exciting bonus as these would be or with these as well. So as we're moving along, one of the other cool aspects is that I don't have the little tokens out. Because there are a lot of tokens, there are a lot of a lot of counters in this game. As you can see, I've got some of them in the bags over here. I mean, there's I mean, there's lots of stuff. This game has uh, has some real heft to it. But you'll have a couple of tokens you can use, and you can actually drop them off as a permanent bonus in the buzz track as you're gaining buzz. Whoever uh, has the most buzz at the end of the game is going to score victory points, second most victory points, third most victory points. I'm kind of showing this off as if we've got four players in this game. And you'll also notice each of these tiles here will show like a, a player count. Like, oh, okay, so number of players. Because there are other tiles to replace, say, for an example, the Bank of England uh, depending on the number of players. So very cool how that uh, scales as well. So I have found, I have not played this with two players. I'll be the first to point out. Uh, we played it mainly with four players. I did play one time with three. And I thought it scaled pretty nicely. As a four-player game, I think it works really, really well. Uh, it will take some time, especially when you first play the game, I got to be honest, if you're playing four players, you want to probably put aside about three hours to get through it to its completion because it is going to be a learning experience. All right. So once you have decided you're going to assign values to your dice and you pay for them out of your cash supply, now what everybody's going to do is they're going to assign dice. You're going to place your dice. And once again, this is going to go in player order so just as an example let's say these were the dice that i was spending so you get to choose wherever you want to go so first off we've got the patent office so the patent office is a location that allows us to gain patents which we are hoping to build prototypes of which are worth 
victory points. So you'll notice here, we've got the various different patents. We've got these uh, kind of oddball um, fictional devices and inventions and things like that. We have a mixture of actual historical figures and fictional characters as well, as far as the characters that we can recruit to assist us in building these prototypes. So we've got a variety of different items here. And if we do build the prototype, we'll get some bonuses. We will also get uh, some additional victory points as well. So one of the things you're gonna notice is up on top, we've got a number of spaces. So that's the number of dice that can be placed there. But below that, we also have these spaces that shows how many actions will be available to us. So even though there's room for five dice, there's only gonna be four actions. And the first two dice are going to also receive newspapers. Newspapers are another currency in the game that we can utilize. So we've got the patent office. So this is where we would be looking to get our patents. So as an example, let's say, all right, I would wanna place my die at the patent office. So I put that there. Then it goes to the next player. The next player says, hey, you know what? I wanna make sure that I get some shares from the Bank of England to get me more money, get me victory points. You'll also notice if we show a minus two with uh, the cash, that means you actually have, have to pay to place your die there. So we will see that there are some, some actions here as well. So for an example here in Westminster, the first player to have the action will actually gain a pound. The second player to get an action will actually pay two pounds for that as well. So remember, we're not gonna get these yet. We're just placing our dice. So then we also have second is the British Museum. That's where we get research tiles. That's how we actually are also able to build our prototypes. It's also important that we get research because on our player board, we have this area here that we need to cover these up because for every one that we don't have covered, we're going to lose two victory points. So one of the ways that cover them is with the research. Another way is with loans and loans aren't necessarily a good thing because they will cost you victory points at the end of the game when you take a loan out. Uh, but to me, sometimes you want to take loans because you'll, you'll use that extra cash to get more victory points than it'll actually cost you at the end of the game. Once again, there's a lot of balancing going on here and it takes some playthroughs before some of this stuff becomes a little more apparent to you. So as an example, we flip these over because you would actually see what these are. And sometimes it's, it's stuff, it's not necessarily going to only be uh, research towards, towards uh, like your prototypes. So here we've got like money. So whenever we see something like that, that's gonna show us what phase does this take place? And it would basically say, hey, we get a pound for having this. But if we ended up with this, we would also get to cover this up. We could do it like this if, like so, right? So we're covering that up so we wouldn't be losing those victory points at the end of the game. All right, moving on to, we got the Bank of England. This is where we buy shares. And we have various different shares based on the year so anywhere from 1849 to 1851. One aspect of the prototypes, which we'll see when I zoom in to show you a little more on the cards, is your victory points are determined by when you actually completed it. Same with the characters here. So some of the characters are more valuable if you get them early on. Others are more valuable if you get them later in the game. Same with some of these prototypes as well. So here we would be looking at adding shares, getting shares in the Bank of England. Then we move to Westminster over here, placing dice. 
is going to allow us to get more influence at the palace is essentially what's going on there. Once again, it's going to show us what are we getting out of this. So we could be getting money. We could be getting a, some bonus energy. We could be getting buzz. We also have the Reform Club. This is where we would be looking to gain characters to, to bring on board to assist us in our research is essentially what's going on. I mean, they really don't. But sometimes they'll give you a one-time bonus or they'll have a, an ongoing bonus available to them as well. They are also worth victory points. Now, you have to actually pay to recruit them. At the patent office, when you put a die up there, you're just taking that patent. As an example, boom, taking that patent. This is a patent I've got. Just like so. It has a cost for me to complete the prototype of this. But I don't have to pay for it. I, I'm not paying anything for it just to take the patent. I paid by placing my die there. And I'll show you when we actually resolve our actions. So as an example, let's say maybe I went like that. When it came back around to my turn again. I would have to, to pay to recruit them. So some are a gear. Once again, that's one of the currencies. Gear and energy. So that is the Reform Club. Then we've got the London Times. Now we've got a variety of these different kind of like plaques that we're going to select randomly. And this is where we're trying to generate buzz. And buzz is important because... Buzz is going to get us special bonuses. Buzz is worth victory points as well. This is also where we've got our turn tracker. So we're starting off in the early uh, half of 1849. So what's going to happen is based upon what we've got as far as this tile and what round we're in, will determine what are we looking for to generate buzz. So here, what it's showing here is this is our revenue. Our revenue is over here on this board. So like I said, there's a lot of icons in this game that you got to keep an eye on. So essentially what it's saying here is if we had a die on this area, that if your income is four, then you would get two buzz. If it's six or higher, three buzz. If it's eight or higher, you would get four buzz. If you had a die here, keeping in mind, remember, you're going to place these as the actions res resolve. So just for the heck of it, just uh, I'm going to throw out some dice on these. Uh, let's do that. You can do this. Once again, as I mentioned, you have to make sure that you are placing the die equal to or higher than that value. So as an example here, if we have like one and one, whoever places it first is going to be ahead of the next person who puts a one. But if somebody put a two, then they actually would bump the other player back because they've got the two. So anyway, so that's what goes on at London Times. Port of London, we have some, some other uh, opportunities to score victory points. We can actually trade in dice. We can trade in workers to get a ticket, which is worth bonuses uh, that can only be done three times in the entire game. That's why we show the three tickets here. We've got Waterloo Station. Once again, this is, this is just giving some, some additional currency. So for an example, the first action would get the two energy, one energy. So it's going to show us here what's going on with that. Then we also have a black market where we're going to have our players adding their assistant actions to the black market's kind of tricky. The black market gets you gears. It can get you cash. It can get you energy. It can get you buzz. And you're always moving all over on this as well. So 
once you're in the black market, you're going to, every round, you're going to drop further down. Uh, if this is all filled up with assistance, then the market actually crashes. The uh, the police raid the black market. So this is this is kind of interesting. It's also a little tricky as well when you're playing through with that also. So those are the the various different areas around London that you can be placing your dice. So what'll happen is once you've everybody's placed their dice, now what you're going to end up doing is you're actually going to take your actions. And you take your actions in the order of these tiles. So here we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then the black market has its own period that we actually worry about the black market. So as an example here, we would go to the patent office and I would move my die down there showing me that I get to claim a patent and I also get a newspaper. That's what that little newspaper is there. So I get to gain a newspaper and add it to my nation board, the marker on my nation board. British Museum, you would be getting research. Let's pretend I got that, remember? And I would show the research down here. And of course that die would, oh, let's just take this. Would have gone like, uh, just as an example, we'll do that. So that would get the research, which I would add to the board, remember, which showed effectively in the sixth phase, I'm going to get a pound, I'm going to get some money. We would at Westminster here, so that would be the action there. I would gain a pound, and I also would advance here, so that advances my influence at Westminster. We've got the Reform Club. This is where you would be paying to recruit the various different characters as well. So once again, if that's, that was first, I would pay to recruit. Let's say I would pay a gear to recruit Yosef uh, Russell, who, if we look, many of these characters are going to have different inventions listed that actually give you a bonus for victory points if you have them and you've actually created the prototype of that patent. So as an example here, we have the Faraday cage. We have Michael Faraday here. So some players might be looking at trying to pick up the Faraday cage and recruit Michael Faraday. So also you notice here, this would have gained the buzz. So we would move the buzz up. We'd move there to the second. They would also get to pay. Let's say we took them. They would pay and they would recruit somebody as well. Let's say they recruited them. Then we would move on to the London Times. That'd be the first one here. So that would gain a newspaper. So that bumped me up to two newspapers there. And then we would look. Okay, so what is the United States Income. Well, everybody's at a four right now. Nobody's actually increased their incomes. So that would gain me two more buzz. Here we would have the Port of London. They would move down there and they could perform the different actions available to them as well with uh, bonus victory points. Got Waterloo Station, move here. They go down here, they would get two energy. So they would gain two of these from the supply and you would just go around removing all your dice, taking your actions on each of these tiles. Of course, you would leave the dice out there until the end of the round. I'm just getting them out of the way to kind of give you an idea of what's going on as far as taking your actions. Once you've taken your actions next, you're going to pay salaries and use your character abilities. So you're going to see here on these different characters, it's going to show you what is their special ability that they've got. Special ability here is going to be the 
uh, one, increase your income one during phase six. So, and of course, this is actually when you would be paying the gear for them, for the salary. And then you're going to go around doing all that. So you're going to make sure that you've taken care of everybody. Then you're going to convert your patents into prototypes. So just as an example here, let's say we took uh, that. So it's going to show us in order for us to convert this patent into a prototype, it would cost us four energy. Obviously enough, we don't have four energy, but it would be something that we would be looking for to get four energy in the future in order to actually have this turn into a prototype, which you flip on over to that side right there. Once you've created the prototype, just flip it over like so. And it's basically, it's going to be presented during the World Exp Exposition. I almost said expedition. <laughs> All right, so once you've done that, next you're gonna go and you're going to take care of income and buzz and any special effect that takes place during the sixth phase which uh, you'll see we've got, especially like so, right? So because we've got Yosef Wrestle, we would actually bump our income up to five. So everybody's going to get their income in pounds. And you're also going to be looking at losing <laughs> income because essentially what's going to happen is that you have expenses that need to be paid. So you're gonna drop your income down by three. Whenever you do your income. So when you're getting ready for the next turn, you're going to end up having to boost up your income once again. So one of the, one of the aspects, another thing that you're going to be doing as far as balancing your play is finding ways for you to be able to boost up your income. So once again, these are these are ways to boost income by getting these shares from the Bank of England, by having special uh, cards like this, for an example, right here. So we also have these assistant actions. So anytime we see these little items here, the little icon there means if if our die is there, we're going to get an assistant action. And it's going to take place immediately. We have to take the assistant action when we place the die. Otherwise, we're going to lose it. And the assistant actions, we can do one of two things effectively. We can increase our objective how close are we as far as to our objective? Now, see, we've got the five income. Well, we were at five, but we were never at five when we had an opportunity for the assistant action. So you can either uh, raise the level of your objective. So if we were at five, we would move our assistant up one, and that would show that, okay, cool. We're going to get an extra victory point at the end of the game for our objective here. Other thing is the black market. Placing your assistance on the black market. So whenever you have an opportunity to put somebody in the black market, you place them in the lowest open spot. So as an example, bing, like so. You would place them in the lowest spot. Of course, once again, we've got all the other players with their assistance as well. So we would usually have quite a few in the black market. So once again, we don't want it completely full because what happens then is black market get, gets busted. Everybody except for the top assistant would be removed, returned back to the players, and now you have to refill 
the black market. So black market is kind of cool as well. Like I said, you can get all different things from the black market, but you have to pay for them as well. You're not just getting them for free. So it's going to tell you how much you have to spend and what you're going to end up getting as well. Plus, it's another way for you to get gears as far as that commodity. So what you're going to do is you're going to go through each of the rounds. So there are five rounds to the game. At the end of every round, we're going to bring out new patents. Of course, these will probably be gone. We're going to bring out new patents. We're going to bring out new characters. We're going to get our dice back. We're going to reset our dice, the values of the dice, pay for those values. And we're going to repeat the process until we've completed the fifth round, which is then the beginning of the 1851 World's Fair. And whoever's got the most victory points, once we tally everything up, is going to be the winner. Now, there are a variety of ways for you to score victory points. So we got victory points from prototypes. We get victory points from the various different characters. We get victory points from shares from the Bank of England. We get, we get victory points for the buzz. We get victory points for our objectives. So there are a lot of ways to get the victory points. Uh, there is a victory point tracker that goes around the board as well. A lot of times I would find that when you would like complete something with the cards, take your victory points then because especially with the, with the prototypes and the characters, their values are different depending on the year that they're either recruited or that they're completed. So you want to make sure that you're scoring your victory points then so there's no confusion. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. I, I finished this in 49, not 50. Well, no, that's already been taken care of. Flip it on over. You're done. Just like so. That's why they're dual-sided like this. So that once you flip this over, we know, all right, that's already been produced as a prototype. And the victory points have been scored. Just like the victory points have been scored for him as well. Plus, we get, uh, we get a little bit of information about what does this represent. Once again, you're going to tally up all the victory points, and whoever comes out on top is the winner. So let's swing on over to the other camera, and I will share my final thoughts and give this a review score. All right, so first thing I got to point out is the first time I tried to play Crystal Palace with four players, two of the gang really intensely disliked this game. So much that we did not even finish. I think, I think we were uh, to the halfway point of 1850. And I have to point out, those two players, they are more kind of like action-oriented games, lighter Euro games. I think, I think this was a little too heavy for them, and there was a little too much going on that they couldn't piece things together. They weren't sure exactly what they should be doing during their, their turns, basically when, when they were, you know, selecting what are the actions that they're going for? Okay. Uh, and then how am I going to put these things together? And, and I get it. I completely get it. Cause I was lost starting the game too. At least I had a bit of a clue what I was looking to do. So for an example, if I recruited somebody who had, like an invention that there was a patent floating around at or vice versa. I tried to get the two of them. And then of course I was looking at, all right, so what do I need component wise, you know, as far as being able to complete that prototype. So as an example, like for energy, so I'd be looking at, okay, so where are the ways that I can get energy <laughs> so I could build this prototype. Some of them were having a bit of a hard time with it. This took a while for me to actually get reviewed. COVID has really thrown a big wrench into my gaming with more than two players. That is for certain. But I really did want to get this played with more than just two players. So I haven't played it with two players. Thankfully, the other two times I played, 
with four. Well, once was with four. The other time was with three. Everybody really enjoyed the game. I really like this. It is a heavier Euro game. It's not the heaviest Euro game I've ever run across. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things you got to juggle. You got to make sure you don't go broke. That's one of the things. I mean, if if you're broke and you're taking loans out, you are not going to win. Once again, though, sometimes taking a loan out at the right time give you the extra dough that you need to get something done. Yeah, it could mean the difference between victory and a loss. The sweet taste of victory or the bitter taste of defeat. I really, really do like Crystal Palace quite a lot. You know what I did not do, though? Let's zoom back. Let's pop back real quick. And I'm going to zoom in just because I want to show, show you the cards a little bit. I also want to kind of show off the component quality. Everything's nice and thick. All of the counters, all the tokens, nice and thick. The cards, I got to be honest, I would have liked to have seen linen cards, a little thicker card stock. You're definitely going to want to sleeve these cards. You really, really do. The artwork's pretty good. I like the artwork quite a bit. Let's give you an idea of some of the other inventions here. The beer glass counter. Pneumatic tube mail. The money printing machine. There are actually quite a few inventions. It's like we've got quite a few different characters. Some are actually real life characters. Some are like, low the paper boy. Right? We got the paper boy on our side. Dr. Watson. I'll give you just Phineas Fogg. So some of them are fictional characters. Some of them are real life characters. As far as the inventions, for the most part, they are kind of oddball fictional inventions for the most part. There are some that are fairly realistic, but for the most part, they are kind of, well, I mean, for the most part, a lot of them are fictional. Like pneumatic tube, those really existed. Money printing machine, all right, that's a little odd, right? So there, it's kind of a mixture of historical and fictional as well. And I got to be honest, I would have preferred one or the other. To me, it just feels a little off, which is one of my critiques about the game. It just feels a little off where we've got a historical event, we've got historical people, we've got some historical inventions or prototypes, and then we've got a mix of fictional as well. Honestly, I think it should have been one or the other, and personally, I think it should have been just, just go all historical. Because the thing is, the game is really cool. Thematically, do you feel like, you know, I'm leading the American contingent as far as, you know, putting together exhibits for the World's Fair? Not really, no. I'm not saying this isn't an excellent game, though. I'm just saying, eh, thematically, it could have been a lot of different things. You're not really feeling like you're you're leading you know, your nation to greatness. That said, very, very cool game. Other uh, little quibble I've got, of course, is cardstock. Like I said, would like to have seen a little better cardstock. Rules are very easy to digest. Yes, when you're first learning to play the game, you're going to be taking a look at the different icons a lot. You're going to be referring to the rules a lot. But at least you're going to find the information. You're not going to have to jump online to try to figure something out. I like how there's all these different things going on. There's all these little decisions you have to make. I also really enjoy the fact that you have to pay for your dice values. And you got to kind of, you know, take your chances, right? You kind of like sometimes you're going to blow a lot of cash because you want to go first. Something out there is something that you really want to get your hands on. Other times you might sit there and, and do some ones and twos because you don't have the cash to really go after some of the good stuff. Love that aspect as well. I think the buzz aspect is cool too. I just really like this game. I will mention it is a little heavier for some people. It's not the heaviest Euro game I've played, but it is a bit more heavyweight than most. And that might 
be a big minus for some people out there. Like I started off this uh, summation by mentioning there were a couple of players with me who just despised this game. I don't know if I'd go that far. They really, really disliked this game because they couldn't wrap their heads around it. This is basically what's going on. Me personally, I think this is excellent. If you enjoy nice, meaty Euro games that are going to make you think a little bit, I definitely think Crystal Palace should be part of your collection. That's why I give it a very, very, very solid recommendation with a 9 out of 10. It is that good. Check it out. All right, that's it for this time out. Once again, let me remind you, if you like this video, by all means, give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't already. And if you do subscribe, ding that bell. It'll not only let you know when I upload videos such as this review, but also tell you when my live stream, the Gaming Gang Dispatch, airs Monday through Thursday nights right here on YouTube as I bring you the latest in tabletop gaming news. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to stop by thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. And I will see you next time as I wrap up all of my videos during this never-ending pandemic. I really do hope all of you out there are being smart and staying safe. Oh, hey, you're still here. Well, if that's the case, by all means, if you haven't subscribed to the Gaming Gang channel yet, click right here. If you'd like to see the latest episode of the Gaming Gang Dispatch, click right up there. And if you want to trust YouTube's algorithm to give you something to watch, click right there. Once again, thanks so much for watching. And everybody, please... Wear a mask.